Today, we'll be focusing a bit of attention on four primary views, and you can see them on this chart. With the yellow arrow, that represents pre-tribulationism, the idea that the rapture happens before the tribulation. On the other side is post-tribulationism, represented by the pink arrow. Right in the middle is an orange arrow, representing mid-tribulationism, the idea that the rapture happens at the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation. And then the pre-wrath view, which places the rapture late in the tribulation before God's wrath falls. Now we'll talk more about that wrath in a little bit, because I think they're, they're wrong on this. But the fact is, it's late in the tribulation period. I gotta tell you, Christians get animated on this. They really do. In fact, some Christians get just a little bit mean about it. <laughs> I don't wanna get mean. In fact, I wanna say this to my post-trib brethren and mid-trib brethren and pre-wrath brethren. If you believe those views, Ron Rhodes still loves you. I'm not gonna break fellowship with you, but I think you're wrong. I don't think you're being biblical and I think it's important to be biblical. The main question I always ask myself is, which view is biblical? In fact, the Eight Great Debates book, that's all I do in that book, which view is biblical? I'm kind of reminded of that second grade girl who came home from Sunday school one day, and she was uh, so excited about what she learned. And so her daddy said to her, she said, what did you learn in Sunday school? And the little girl said, oh, dad, it was just so awesome, so great, because you see, God created Adam first. But then God saw that it was not good that Adam be alone. So God put Adam to sleep. And when Adam was asleep, God took out his brain and made a woman out of it. <laughs> and all the women said? <laughs> no, that's not biblical. That's in Second Illusions, chapter 3. We need to be biblical. Now the thing of it is, my friends, in covering four different views, we can only give a representative sampling of some of the main arguments here. I'd really prefer to have five hours for this session. Dave, can I take five hours? No, he's not gonna let me take five hours. I've got 50 minutes with you today. And so I'm gonna take some of the most important arguments that the different views offer, and we'll talk about those, okay? Does that sound fair? Let's begin with pre-tribulationism, which is my personal view. And this is the view that says that the uh, rapture will take place before the tribulation even begins. And of course, the tribulation period is a seven-year period during which God's wrath is poured out, out on the world prior to the second coming. Now, this means that we'll be exempt from all the judgments that fall during the tribulation, including the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the bowl judgments. The pre-tribulational view says we won't go through any of these. That's good. That's good. Now, why do I believe in pre-tribulationism? There are six primary reasons. Can I share them with you? No, I'm going to share them anyway. No, I can't. Here we go. Number one, the tribulation focuses on Israel and unbelieving nations, not the church. The tribulation focuses on Israel and unbelieving nations, not the church. How do we know that it focuses on Israel? Well, the tribulation is one and the same as Daniel's 70th week. Now, here's the backdrop. In Daniel 9, God provides a prophetic timetable for the nation of Israel. And he talks about 70 weeks of years. The first 69 group of seven years, or 483 years, counted the years from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes. Now, when Jesus rode on a donkey into Jerusalem and people were singing Hosanna and were waving palm branches, that was 483 years to the day. To the day. An amazing prophecy. At that point, God's prophetic clock stopped. Daniel describes a gap between those 483 years and the final seven-year period in the prophetic timetable. Several events were to take place in that gap. The Messiah would be killed. The city of Jerusalem and its temple would be destroyed. And the Jews would encounter difficulty and hardship from that time on. The final week of seven years begins when the Antichrist signs a covenant with Israel. That is the thing that begins the 70, 70th week of Daniel. Now here's what I'm building up to. Here's the main point. All that was backdrop, and here's the main point. The 70 weeks deal with Israel, not the church. They deal with Israel, not the church. Now, 
You have to compare scripture with scripture and look up all the verses on the tribulation. And when you do that, we also discover that during the tribulation, God deals with the unbelieving nations who have rejected him. And he pours out his wrath upon them. So the tribulation deals with Israel and unbelieving nations, but not the church. This is important. Number two, the church is missing in tribulation passages. The church is missing in tribulation passages. For example, in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, we find the word church 19 times. But then in the chapters of Revelation that deal with the tribulation, chapters 4 through 18, you don't find the church mentioned once. Not once. And then when you sort of back up and do a panoramic sweep of the entire Bible, we see that no Old Testament passage on the tribulation mentions the church, and no New Testament passage on the tribulation mentions the church. I think that that is a resoundingly powerful argument that the church is not there. Now, I need to make a qualification here. Some people will say, well, wait a minute. There are believers during the tribulation period. Yes, but we believe they become believers after the rapture. I'll talk more about that just a little bit later. Number three, the church is not appointed to wrath. The church is not appointed to wrath. Romans 5, 9 says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Now notice also 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. The Greek word for delivers means to snatch out to oneself. Does that not sound like the rapture to you? It means to snatch out. Now 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 says that we are caught up. But this verse says that we are snatched out of the time of wrath. That sounds like the rapture. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, my friends, all this means that we cannot possibly go through the great day of wrath, which is the tribulation period. Does that make sense? Good. Number four, it's God's pattern to protect his people before his judgment falls. Enoch was transferred to heaven before the judgment of the flood. Noah and his family were in the ark before the judgment of the flood. Lot was taken out of Sodom before judgment was poured out on Sodom and Gomorrah. The firstborn among the Hebrews in Egypt were sheltered by the blood of the lamb before judgment fell. The spies were out of Jericho and Rahab was secured safely before judgment fell on Jericho. So too will the church be rescued by the rapture before God's wrath falls on the world during the tribulation period. So God delivers his people before judgment. Number five, in Revelation 3.10, Jesus speaks the following words to the church at Philadelphia. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. Now, my friends, the word keep you from, or the phrase keep you from, literally means to be saved out of. It does not mean to be saved in the midst of or saved through. It means saved out of. You see, and we're going to be saved out of the hour of trial, the time period itself. You see, so post-trips who say that God is going to save us through the tribulation, that just doesn't make sense. And it's also a global trial, not just located in Philadelphia, but all over the planet Earth. In fact, no matter where you live on planet Earth, you're going to experience God's wrath. God is going to keep the church out of that time period. By the way, this promise is not just to the church at Philadelphia. How do we know that? Well, our text goes on to say, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Plural. I believe that this is a promise to all true Christians, that we will be saved out of the tribulation period. And then number six, the restrainer will be removed. Now, for this part, put on your thinking caps. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is in the context of the tribulation period. And in that context, we read the following words in verse 7. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. So here's what's going on. Lawlessness will continue to or come to a climax in the future tribulation under the person of the Antichrist, who fully embodies lawlessness as he is energized by the devil. In fact, 2 Thessalonians 2 tells us that he's energized by the devil. So lawlessness is going to increase greatly. 
But in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, we are told of someone who restrains the mystery of lawlessness and the emergence of the Antichrist. Is it a human being? I don't think so, because I don't think human beings are strong enough to withstand Satan. Is it human government? Well, there are some good Christians who hold to that viewpoint. That's not my viewpoint. My viewpoint is that it's the Holy Spirit. I believe that only the Holy Spirit has the power to withstand Satan and his work through the Antichrist. Now, we know that the Holy Spirit dwells the church. How do we know that? Well, we read, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 3.16. And do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? 1 Corinthians 6.19. Now, only the Holy Spirit has the power to withstand Satan. When the rapture happens, the church indwelt by the Holy Spirit is removed from the earth and that in turn removes the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit. So to me, it all makes good sense. And when common sense makes good sense, seek no other sense, lest you end up in nonsense, right? So in sum, I am a pre-trib for the following reasons. The tribulation focuses on Israel and the nations, not the church. The church is noticeably absent from all tribulation passages. The church has promised deliverance from the coming wrath. God's consistent pattern is to rescue his people before judgment falls. The judgment or the church is promised to be kept from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. And the removal of the restrainer of the Holy Spirit from earth necessitates the removal of the church. To me, those are good, sound reasons for the pre-tribulational viewpoint. 